Hi, I'm Jo Clark, and thanks so much for joining me today. This is the Redefining Midlife podcast, a podcast designed for the 40 plus woman who is determined to challenge society's myths and beliefs around midlife. It's for the woman who is inspired and ready to define midlife her way. Join me each week as I chat to health and wellness experts for up-to-date information on how to live well, as well as some special conversations with incredible everyday women redefining what midlife can look like. Here's to making our next half of life even better than the first. Today, you'll be meeting Tracy Harris, a woman who is a very special person in my life. Before we begin, I want to give you a little bit of background about the Tracy of today. Tracy is a founder and head coach at tracyharris.co, which happens to be Australia's leading online community and online education platform for mums in business. Tracy is fiercely dedicated to supporting big-hearted women who are wanting to design their life first and a business second by using Instagram as part of a complete digital strategy. As a successful seven-plus-figure digital entrepreneur, she also helps women to grow and scale their own online courses and memberships. I met Tracy a number of years ago, and there were a few things that instantly aligned with me. It was her warmth, approachability, passion, values, and the philosophy of life first, work second. And we also had a few things in common as well. The main one was we both left the teaching profession burnt out, yet both of us wanted to create something that was going to support and empower women to create and live their best lives. Tracy has been incredibly successful and leads by example, so I wanted to learn more from her. And for the past two years, I've been a member of her Inner Circle Mastermind that she and her fabulous husband, Carl, facilitate. And in that time, Tracy has been an incredible mentor who has taught me so much, and she stretches me well and truly out of my comfort zone at times as all good mentors should. The person I am today is in part to my time and my association with Tracy, and she's become a very special friend in the second half of life for me. In this episode, we're going to discover more about how from small beginnings, Tracy became an incredibly successful self-made digital entrepreneur and mentor to thousands of mums and women in business. So lovely to have you on the podcast, Tracy, and we're going to get you straight into answering some questions. But before that, welcome. Thanks. Happy to be here. I'm Um, I'm very excited. Also a little bit nervous. Yes. Actually, I'm I'm asking you some questions this time around. Normally it's you asking us questions when we're when we're in the ICM. (laughs) Yeah. Well, bring it on. (laughs) Tracy, our younger years really inform the women that we Uh, today. And I'm just wondering if you could share with us what your childhood was like, uh, where you grew up and how you found it. How did it shape you, do you think, to be the woman you are today? Oh, what a lovely question. I am pretty much now working my way back to how I was as a child, which is really fun. Uh, But I can imagine how difficult it was for my parents. So I was born and raised for the first five years of my life in Cape Town, South Africa. Very conservative family, very strict church every Sunday, probably multiple times a week. I don't know. Like it was just, it was so beautiful and so loving. But I would have been challenging to my very conservative parents because I think I just danced my way out of the womb. And then by the age of four years old, I was already mingling at preschool and coming home with people's phone numbers and telling my mum that I'd organised play dates. And she was telling me, Tracy, no. Like, and I got in trouble for that because that was labelled as being really forward and out of turn for a child. That's something that the parents do. And are you giving our phone number around and all of this stuff? And then, you know, I'd be nagging. I'd be like on the weekends, like, oh, what are we doing? What are the plans? Where are we going? Or pulling out a phone number, you know, and dialing someone's number. And mum's like, what are you doing? And I've just invited myself over 2 p.m., da-da-da, meet you there. And my mum was just like, who are you? Like, this is not, this is not appropriate. So, yeah, I learned to do less of that because obviously I was getting in trouble for it. But also I loved fashion from day one. So I remember 
challenging my mum again. Poor mum. Um, <laughs> uh, with what I wanted to wear, again, to church versus what she wanted me to wear. She'd picked out this outfit. She had this vision of my younger sister and I matching, but I was like, I don't want to wear that. I don't want to match her. I've got my own style and my own vibe. And so then getting in trouble, or I guess it it busted, it burst mum's bubble, you know. I remember her being angry. Well, just wait, you want them, you know. Mm. And she like threw yeah. the dress on the bed. And then I felt sad, but also didn't care because I went to my wardrobe and put on whatever vibe I was feeling for that day. I can just, I can just picture a little Tracy doing something like that. Oh yeah. A little Tracy. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Little, little things like, you know, I was labeled madam because I was just such a madam, you know, or bossy or always opinionated or seeking too much independence from a very young age and that was really hard. Like for me, that was really hard because I did feel more mature than my age Um, and I certainly could sit in the company of adults and contribute to the conversation, hold the conversation, understand everything that was being said, but then also mum and dad chasing me out of the adult company Mm -hmm. saying, can you please go play with the kids now? Because we want to have an actual conversation. And I'm like, but I totally understand. I'm making great connections at this table. And they're like, yeah, but you're also 10 years old. Yep. Um, please go. I was like, that that hurt my feelings. But, you know, now that I'm a mom, I do not want my child or children sitting around being privy to our conversation. Because grown-ups want to, you know, decompress and vent and be silly or talk about things that aren't always appropriate for children. But yeah, I was very much very social, loved my clothes, loved my dancing, all of that, loved to talk. And look at me now, pretty much exactly the same. (laughs) (laughs) So you had you had a number of years in where you started to conform to what everybody else is that what was that what happened for you? Like you totally. Yes. So I learned some self-preservation techniques. Obviously, how to not get in trouble was to dress a certain way that was more accepted or liked or prioritized the feelings of how the parents would feel like, oh, they bought me that dress. They really want me to wear, you know. Because that's what a good girl does. That's what a good girl does. And then you get praised. So, you know, that always feels good. Mm. And, yeah, just kind of towing the line or not contributing to a conversation even though it sparks joy and you feel like you can contribute because it you'll be checked for that you know yeah so slowly over time silencing yourself or being worried about oh if I contribute my opinion it's just going to be oh here she goes again another eye roll another opinion um so slowly over time you stop doing that yeah and then it gets reinforced that that that's a good way to be because you get celebrated and praised for that behavior or, and then you go to school and and you mimic that behavior there. And now you start getting awards for that behavior. Mm. And so slowly, slowly, it's like, oh, this is how I'm supposed to be. This is safe. This is when I feel accepted by the group or the community or the family or whatever. And so you just dial it in, you do more of that. And as a result, you lose your original personality and you end up creating a new personality, which did serve me really well until it didn't. Um, That way of being probably got me all the way through to the heights of my career as a primary teacher or educational leader. And then it all came tumbling down, Joe. Because oh, we'll talk about that coming up soon, Tracy. Oh, stay tuned, we've, everyone. We've, we've got a, yeah, a common thread happening with that as well. <laughs> so, Tracy, you and your you actually didn't grow up in Australia. You and your you came from South Africa. Am I correct in saying that? Yes. Well, yeah. I started school here, so I was five when okay. when we arrived in Australia. Yeah, and. Your father passed away when you were quite a young girl. So how did that, how old were you? And, and how did that influence on yourself and, and your family losing losing your dad? Uh, it altered absolutely everything. 
And so I was 17 when he passed away and he died from cancer and his diagno- from diagnosis to his death was only six months. Mm. So it was very fast and sudden for us. Yeah. And he died at the age of 46 years old, oh. Joe. Oh, Trace, yeah. That's... I know. And he had like four kids, myself included, and my super, well, I'll say young. My mum always was telling herself a story that she's old. She still says this story. Um, I'm going to say super young, hot mum, chicky babe. Like what was she, 40, 47 years old Yeah. with these four children? Wow. You don't. No one expects to lose the love of their life and their best friend no. at that age. No. And, and so and when you're close to that age, doesn't it? Like when you go, oh, my God, that was only for you. You know, that's, only, that's yeah. seven years away. Yeah. Yep. And for my brother, like, you know, he's four years older than me and I can just imagine mm. that he must think about that from time to time because we are approaching that age scary and so yeah it did it altered absolutely everything and it really taught me like it took that cliche of life is short to a whole other level Mm. to the point that it really frustrates me when I hear people say it but then they don't live like that and it's sad that we have to experience deaths and passing of loved ones or people that we know to have a little wake up call. But then what happens is people then just go back still to their pre-programmed ways. And it's like, did that not click for you? Mm. So yeah, that happened. I was 17 years old and I just forever decided that I'm going to live differently. Like what if we lived as though every experience truly is the only time we'll experience that. And it really is. So when we went on our honeymoon, I got married um, at 23, we really stretched ourselves financially to go on this lavish honeymoon. We went to the Maldives, didn't even have a car or a fridge, but we went to the Maldives. Look at you two go. I know. And my mum was like, this is ridiculous. This is so expensive. I think it was $13,000 for seven nights or something like that. And she's like, you need a car. I'm like, well, we just believe that we'll get a car eventually. But also we really wanted our honeymoon to forever stay etched in our minds as the best holiday we've ever done, regardless of our financial situation improving over the years, which we knew it would. We were still like, even in 20 years from now, when we're not so poor, when we do have a fridge, we'll look back and we'll be like, that was still the best holiday we've ever done. Like nothing can mm. compete with with our honeymoon. And so that was what we went into it with. And so we stretched ourselves and we went to the Maldives and I can safely say like all these years later, it was still the best experience we've ever had. And we'll never be that age again. We'll never have those fit bodies again. <laughs> oh, I think your, your your body's going pretty damn good if I say so myself. Yeah, she goes all right. <laughs> but you should have seen me when I was 23. <laughs> <laughs> but you it's know, so true, isn't it? As you get older, you and you, you saw that as at a younger age, and maybe it was because of the experience that you went through. But I know for myself, the last probably uh, 10, 20 years, it's experience over stuff. Give me a great yeah. experience anytime over, you know, more things because things can disappear. But those experiences, you know, as you've found and you can relive those right now, it takes you back. Look at a photo Surely. and you're there. Listen to a song, you're there. Look at a photo. You know, there's just so many things that you can, yeah, you can reflect on with an experience. Yes. And we need to start living those experiences now instead of putting them in the future or just putting them on the vision board because my dad loved Australia so much. Like, oh my gosh, he'd even put his Aussie accent on like 10, like 10 (laughs) notches up. Like he just was so proud. He loved it. And he really wanted to go to Queensland. And he was like, oh, I'd love to go to Queensland. It looks so beautiful up there. But we never went. We always put it on the 
oh no, mm. like we we'll do that later or we'll do that another time or we prioritized other things. And like financially things were really hard for my family for a very long time. It is hard to immigrate from a country and have the exchange rate be what it was and and all of the things. And the interest rates at that time, 1990, like, you know, shocking. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, we never went for a myriad of reasons, but we really could have gone. We could have gone at the sacrifice of other things. So it's all about your priorities. And so, well, what did we do like six months after we died? Well, we all went to Queensland, didn't we? And it was lovely. We went in his honour and Carl was my boyfriend then. He's my husband now, everyone. Carl was there, my sisters, my mum, and we went and we just got to soak it up for him. But even being there, I was just like, why didn't we do this with dad? And that was really sad. Yeah. And yeah, so I just don't want to live like that. I don't, I try to always bring things into the now. Yep. Because now is all we have. Like how much time do you think you've got? You don't know. You might think you've got 30 years ahead, 40 years, 50 years, whatever. Totally. You, yeah. You're not the one to say things happen. Yeah. So that's what it, it, it is really seize the day, isn't it? Seize the day and less attachment to money. Yep. I don't know if, and I know that that can sound like, oh, it's because oh, easy for you to say, come from a place of privilege. Yes, now, but like I didn't always. And I still like choosing love, choosing making memories, choosing moments, choosing experiences, like you said, like that. that's more important yep. than money. Like money will come and go. But when we have such an attachment to money and how people perceive us, it's like it alters how we, the choices that we make. Mm. So it's like, well, what do you really want to be experiencing in life in the future? And then being really honest and taking ownership of how you're being in the present because it's how we're being in the present that creates our future. Mm -hmm. So if we're saying I want to have like this fit body, I want to have this beautiful marriage. I want to be having fun with my like girlfriends, annual holidays every year or whatever. It's like, well, are you doing things that show that that's a priority for you? I love those conversations. Oh, me too. Because I can guarantee, Trace, when when you're on your deathbed, you're not going to be thinking of your uh, all the things that you've amassed over time. You're going to be reflecting on all the times that you had, the people who you loved, who what you you know what you were doing at a certain point. And when you're around the bedside of anyone who's passing away, you're not talking about all of the wonderful things that they've got. You're talking about <laughs> all of the fun things that you did together. And you know that's yeah, and uh, yeah, it, it, it's one of those incredible times where I think you've got to really sit back and ask yourself like you were saying uh, is what you're doing uh, taking you towards the things that you truly say that you want or is are you playing it safe and just not not working or not walking towards that thing in particular yeah so just go do the thing Mm. like live like it's your last if you're on a dance floor dance hard be cringy on the dance floor, bust the moves. Oh, you've um, seen me busting a sad old move. So. Ah, they're hot. I love those <laughs> moves. It gave permission for all of the other women around you to move too. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Joe is a firecracker, everyone. You need to <laughs> become her friend yes. and hang out with Joe more. You'll have a hoot of a time. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, dear. <laughs> now, Tra- when you, you had a teaching career like myself did you want to always be a teacher because I for myself I wanted to be a teacher from a very young age was that the same for you yes Mm. I did like I well I only learned like as I got a, a, a bit older like in my teens that my dad's father was a teacher um so yeah interesting but I wanted to be a teacher well before I heard that I used to, you can call me a suck up, but I used to stay behind after year two and I used to ask the teacher if I could help clean the classroom and if she had any spare worksheets from the day that I could take home. And 
you know, then I'd take them home and I'd play schools with my teddies and my dolls and I would complete the worksheets and then I'd be switch hats, be the teacher and mark the worksheet. Uh, <laughs> that's almost parallel universe. I'm going, hang on, I was a bit like that kid too. <laughs> yeah, I marked the role yep, at home, yes. you oh, know. Oh, you, you also things like a library monitor. Oh, I was all of the things. Mm-hmm. And on wet days and you were, when I think it was around about grade four, five four or five when you're old enough and it was a wet day you could go and supervise that was a day you supervise the grade ones and twos that would have been cool oh, I didn't get to do and, that and but... I was also milk monitor you might have been too young for that but our milk monitor was a very important job as well when the free milk used to go around the the lukewarm milk given to all the school children who got oh that's very hygienic <laughs> oh <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> I didn't have that but I did get to do office duty and answer the phone Oh. For the principal and like oh. transfer calls through. No, you trumped me there. Oh. There was no way that that would have happened in in our school. But uh, I got to make announcements on the PA. Oh, how you fancy! You were fancy. I know. I was podcasting before there was a name <laughs> for podcasting. <laughs> And I always said just a little bit extra that didn't need to be said. Like I always went off script a little bit. Uh huh. All right, so you had, you had that streak. That streak did come out every now and then. One thing I was given was uh, my grade six teacher back. Uh, you may, and again, I might be. Sh- I'll probably be showing my age here. Did you ever hear of? Um, there was used to have a powder called Bex and another one okay. called Vincent's Vincent's powder or Bex powders, and they used to be give them little like people used to get little kicks out of them. My job with my grade six teacher was to go across to the shop of a morning to buy his. <laughs> He's either a packet of Bex or a packet of Vincent's. Mm. Oh my gosh, oh, that's unbelievable! That's unbelievable! <laughs> unbelievable! <laughs> so yeah, we're both goody two shoes. So we both had that drive and want to be a teacher. So that was what you wanted to do when you went to through, it through was primary strong. Through, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I now know that my definition of being a teacher was just limited to the context that I've seen it in. And so all I saw was, oh, a teacher equals school, equals classroom with four walls, equals chalkboard or whiteboard or smartboard as it ended up turning into, Mm. equals, you know, this, that and the other. I still identify as being a teacher because I'm an educator. I love education. Mm. If you want to change your life, educate yourself like it's that simple it is the best weapon for advancing yourself or changing your life and changing changing the world um and that's what I love I have a deep love of education and passing education on because what good is knowledge if it isn't shared and I love facilitating experiences like not just teaching knowledge but facilitating integration and embodiment of the knowledge Um, And that's why I teach in the modalities of online courses, memberships, masterminds. Mm. Yeah. So I still am very much a teacher, but my gosh, not just in the limited context of a school. Yeah. It's using those skills in a different way. And and I I consider myself really fortunate to have those skills. Oh, yeah. Because they're they're almost like a superpower for when you compare yourself to somebody who doesn't have those skills. It is a game changer when you can learn from someone or have a mentor or a coach that has an education background like yourself, Joe, because we come with that understanding of how people actually learn Mm. and, you know, different teaching styles and different modalities and differentiating things for people that, you know, learn in different ways. Like these are things that I have observed over my last eight and a bit years as a digital entrepreneur who has taken many courses from brilliant people. Like those things are lacking Mm. in a lot of the programs. Like it's all boring or it's death by PowerPoint or they're cookie cutter courses and things like that. And so I think, yeah, with our educational background, just going to toot our own horn here, we bring a really unique skill set that enhances the experience and the transformation for the people that are in our containers. Yep, for sure. Yeah, I yeah. agree totally. So you not only, I think you're saying um, 
you're going to be a lifelong educator, but you're also a lifelong learner. So combining those two is a powerful mix. Oh yeah. My love of education doesn't just ex- doesn't just mean that I teach other people. It means that I'm a learner always. And I love that so much. I love finding something that I don't know. And then I lean into that and I go and explore that or I invest money in learning that skill or that piece of knowledge. And I continue to invest to take things, not just from basic knowledge, but taking things to mastery also, because there's layers of knowledge and understanding. And so I always have a mentor or many mentors in the areas of my life that I say are important. Um, I It would be a red flag for me if my mentors didn't have mentors also. Mm. So I have mentors. Yep. I mentor women like yourself, but I know my mentors have mentors too. And that just, because we're never done, like, you know, Taking things to mastery, well, that takes years, not minutes. Um, It takes a lifetime. I agree. The more more you know about something, the more you realise you don't know. Oh, totally. There's that that real, and again, I think it it shows your level of commitment to yourself when you want to invest in yourself and become better. And know that that's not going to be the end point where you think you've reached it. There's always somewhere oh. further to go and something more interesting to to look at, another way of thinking and seeing. Yes, 100%. Like I'm never done. Mm. I can't remember who said it. But, you know, it's something like at the, the top of one mountain is really just the bottom of the next. Yep. And so it's exciting. Like mm-hmm. I think, well, there are two two groups of people. There's the people that find that, oh, oh, overwhelming. Oh, no. How annoying. Now we've got to, got to go learn something new, which is the fixed mindset person. And then there's the growth mindset of like, oh, my gosh, I've come this far. I didn't come this far to just come this far. I'm going to keep going. How exciting. Like what else is there? What's at the top of that mountain? Yes. And so then we scale that one together with other people because it's just more fun that way also. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I, I, the, the possibilities are endless on where you can go and what you can do. And just to have somebody open up your eyes to what they can be, that's quite exciting and liberating. Scary sometimes as well because you're pushed into, when you're being mentored, you're, you're also pushed into trying things that you may not think you're ready for, but you do anyway. And then you discover it wasn't that bad after all. (laughs) Yes. Well, who wants to be with a mentor that isn't challenging them? Hmm. Like you should feel a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah. You are being held accountable to your light, to your potential. You are being held accountable to the things that you said that you wanted. So a good mentor is going to challenge you. And maybe even say, well, you know, a bit of tough love. You did say that you wanted this, but this behaviour is counteracting that. What is that about? Mm. And then sitting there with that person to unpack that. But that mentor-mentee relationship is also really special. It does need to have trust in there. I think that's a key as well. Choosing mentors that we trust is important. Yeah. Yeah. Well put, Miss Tracy. Now, I want to talk about, we, we touched on education and the fact that you chose that as a career. And for you and I, education and our teaching career was great until it wasn't. Yeah. And, and for you, <laughs> and that that's a hard thing, isn't it? When you suddenly decide that what you had your eye, your ideal life was going to be around this particular career. What was it for you? And at what point did, in your life did you go, I can't do it anymore? Well, it was so hard. I can speak about it now with like, I don't know, such ease, but for a good couple of years there, if you asked me to talk about it, I would have cried. Like at its peak of tension and stress for me, I barely left the house, Joe, in case I would bump into a colleague at the shops. I remember one day I had my son in in the trolley. He was um, like, what, 18 months old, two years old. And for any new mum, it's hard enough to get out of the house. And so, you know, got out of the house, is in the trolley, trolley's now full of staff. And I saw in the distance 
a colleague of mine. And this was during a time where I had been on a mental health break because everything had kind of come to a head. And I just couldn't imagine speaking to her and answering her the dreaded question Mm. of how are you or, oh, how come you haven't been at school? And so I literally grabbed Ethan out of the trolley, left it there, and I just went home. I didn't even take it to the checkout. It was just like I cannot talk, I cannot deal, like I would just break down. Because it did, it hurt so much. Um, I had a large piece of my identity as a person wrapped up in what I did. Yep. So I had let my job and my career progression and all of those accolades and the the weight of I'm the first person in my family to ever go to university. I have three degrees. You can imagine what my hex debt was like. Mm-hmm. Um, all of these reasons to stay. But it wasn't leading to that vision of my future self and what I truly wanted for myself and my family. It was never leading there. But thankfully what helped me was experiencing a level of, I guess, injustice um, as a new mum returning to work after maternity leave. I experienced a subconscious meaning the individuals, I really don't believe they knew that they carried a bias, excuse me, but I encountered a maternal bias. So a lot of people carry a maternal bias against mothers when they return to work and they imagine certain things. They're carrying their own stories and belief patterns about a woman's capacity to be successful in career, particularly in leadership, and then, you know, be able to be mum at the same time and all sorts of things. And it's not even true. And so you can't unfortunately change people's perceptions. It's very, very difficult to do that. Mm. Um, And these are deeply ingrained societal beliefs that people hold. And so, yeah, that became really challenging. And it didn't feel nice to work there anymore. And even just little things like, oh, you're in leadership. You don't work on a Tuesday, so you'll be at home, but you still need to log on at 3.30 for the staff, for the leadership, team leadership meeting. Hmm. And it's like, not available. I'm looking after my baby. You know, things like that happening all the time. And then they turn around and say, oh, you're not not very committed since you've become a mum. We've noticed a shift in your you know, things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if those things would be said. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if those things are still being said. I really hope not. Like that was like almost 10 years ago now. So hopefully it's different now. But that's some of the vibe, not just a vibe, some of the things that were said. Mm. Um, But I'm glad it was, Joe, because I was such a loyalist, again, to my own identity and to what I thought was my purpose. I was missing the bigger picture. It wasn't that career had served its purpose and I'm so grateful, um, but it was time to step out and do something new and step into a different era for myself and my family and utilize my gifts and talents in another way. And there is nothing wrong with trying many things in life. Mm. Like why do we have to just have one thing and then stick at it and even not enjoy it and have it bring you stress and anxiety and why do we have to have that feeling of, oh, there's supposed to be more than this, right? Yeah. And then not honour it. No, it's okay. It's okay, to, it's okay to start new. It's okay to quit things. It's okay to move on. It, it's all good. So I believe that happened for a reason and I'm really grateful. It was just an opportunity for my values, my true values to bubble to the surface. And then when they did, I had a choice. Yep. I could ignore my values and just kind of do all the things that's that work wanted me to do, but it wouldn't lead to my future self. Or I could choose myself, my spirit, my soul, my inner being, my family, and go with that. Yeah. Even though I didn't know what the bigger picture would look like. And that's what I chose. And that's what I encourage everyone to choose because you can never go wrong when you follow that feeling. No, that, and that, that there's got to be more. 
That's right. That resonates so deeply with me because although the the reason behind was different, what you said towards the end, that was just, yep, yep, yep. And it was, it eats away at you and you don't want that. So congratulations for you to discover that and take that brave step at a younger age, because for a lot of women, they keep on pushing through, pushing through until, you know, that's why I've called this podcast redefining midlife, because a lot of women get to this age in the middle of life and they go, enough's enough. I've put up with this now for decades. I've got, you know, 30, 40 years ahead of me. I don't want to keep on doing what I've been doing. So that's, that's huge that you discovered that and made that step at a younger age. So you used many of the skills that you had from your teaching career to create a brand new business mm. from scratch. And that's that's another very brave thing to do. So tell me more about the the, the start of the business because a lot of the, the listeners don't know or may not know about your story. So just, you know, fairly uh, an abrupt. A, 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 um, a fast version of what your business was at the start and at, at what the, point uh, yeah at the beginning yeah. of the business and then at what point did your husband Carl come into your business okay I forget that people don't know this so thank yeah. you yeah yeah um okay so I started first by growing an online community I had nothing to sell so technically not a business I did register a business name though um, but yeah, technically not a business because there was nothing to sell. So I started my business, I guess, in the opposite way to how most people start a business. And that is that I built a community first around a cause and a movement. And this is actually what I believe is the smartest way to go into business. Um, not the only way, but it is a very smart way to go into business because from that community on Instagram and my podcast listeners from day one, I now was getting feedback from them about what landed, what didn't. Everything was data. Every Instagram post I put up, I got information from that. Every podcast episode, I got information. Every email I sent, I sent emails like from the very beginning, from my first week in business even though I think my email list had two people on it. But those that's how we all start. Zero listeners, zero subscribers, zero followers, no connections. And just starting by building a community around a common cause and putting out everything as an experiment, um, just simply sharing what I was doing in my business with the hopes of it inspiring or helping someone else in theirs that they were my content pillars. Just teach everyone what you're doing, Tracy. That's it. And it grew and it grew. And at about six months in, I was starting to get people on Instagram messaging me and saying like, can we please have an event? Can we please have, we, 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 I want to meet you or I'd love to li- like meet other mums in business. And so I just did that. I hosted an event for 50 women um, and that's got a cool manifestation story behind it. We'll have to save that for another day, Joe. But I hosted the event. It was sold out in like, I don't know, a day and a half or something crazy. And we all met in person. And at that event, several of those ladies were asking me like, so when are you going to come out with something for us to buy? And that's when I was like, oh, I'm not really serving these people, am I? Like, you got to give your people something. So then I, well, the next smart question, I think, is to ask people, well, what do you want me to create for you? And every single one of them, they weren't all standing around together. These are separate conversations. But every single one of them said, I want you to teach me how to grow a community on Instagram, like what you've done. Because you started way after me, but you've surpassed me. And look at this beautiful community of people that are here now in person. And like, I want that. Hmm. And so then I just thought, okay, well, I can't teach absolutely everything about Instagram because I didn't feel like I'd really cracked it. It didn't feel authentic to me to be teaching something that I hadn't achieved myself yet. And so I simply started with my first course, just teaching one aspect of Instagram that I knew I had nailed. And if they did these things, they would nail it too. 
And so it was a course with a very, very narrow outcome and focus. And I still sell that course to this day. It's called Hashtag Hustle. That's how I found you, actually. Really? Years ago, yes. I did yeah. not know this. There you go. Hey? So that's what happened. Huh. Like you just have to start and you yes. have to start messy. Yeah. Oh, like no fancy where I had no website. I, well, I'll say it was a logo, but designers may come for me. It was not. It was like, I don't even know what it was. It was made in some little app. It was so gross. Like, but who cares? Yeah. You should, you should cringe. If you're not cringing at your earliest attempts, it meant that you procrastinated. Yep. You got tied up in perfection and you probably waited too damn long before and you, know you what? got That's started. It's hard when you are a bit of a perfectionist. Because oh, yeah. the as you see, for somebody who likes to strive for, you know, an A, that is that was me too. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think I had nothing to lose, Joe. Mm. I had nothing to lose because I'd already left my job. Yep. And here I was with this jumbo mortgage. We just bought this new house and had our first baby. And now we're on one income and we knew that we wanted to have a second baby. And so I was just like, what do you do when your back's against the wall? I couldn't be one foot in, one foot out. So I had nothing to lose. I was just going for it. And so I did. But I think I can always rely on myself. I will never let myself down. I can say that hand on heart. I will always find a way. And so if that didn't work, then I would have tried something else. And that that's also me as the perfectionist. Like, so yeah, I could, it was hard to do it messy, but I did. Um, but I, the perfectionist trait in me also allows me to just be relentless. Like I will not stop until I've cracked it. You know, like if that's, if, if it didn't work out, it's because that wasn't meant to be because there's something else better. Like I really operate from that. Or if it didn't work out, it's because the timing wasn't right. Or if you got rejected, it's not a rejection personally. It's like protection. That's not right for you. Not at this time. So I really believe things like that are removed from my life all the time. So when I operate like that, I'm just like, everything really is always working out for me. What will be will be. And if it doesn't work out, that's fine. I'm moving on to the next. Yeah. But yeah. And so then the business just kept on growing to the point where your husband it, Carl could leave his paid job and together you create the business to go even further. Yes. I know. How cool is that? That was that was life-changing. And so that happened maybe in the third year. Oh, I have to go and check. That could have been at the end of the third year um, in business. And that was that was initiated by him. Hmm. He we weren't killing it in terms of revenue. I mean, it was already, it was over six figures at this stage. Um, so some people will be like, Psh, that's killing it. I wish I had that. I understand. But to not have that income to fall back on, that felt very scary. Yes. And he had a multiple six-figure salary and a really lovely job and he loved his job and he was great at it and amazing team, amazing like leadership, everything. So he wasn't leaving because he didn't like it, but he said, He'd like to leave because he wanted to be more present with our boys while they were really young versus only being there on the weekends and then like, you know, being that cool dad, like when they're older, it's like, I want to get, I want to be in the trenches of parenthood. Like why do most men have to miss out on that? Mm. That didn't sit well with him. And so even though we took a step back financially, we prioritize that time together. He's like, I want to be in the mess with you. So when my youngest was born, that was the week that Carl quit his job. Wow. So he was there from the entire, like Ethan was two and nine months and Jude was, yeah, just born and he never went back to work. So our kid, our boys don't know any different. No, they don't, no, they just think this is normal. Yeah. No, that's very special. 
And did you ever in your wildest dreams nine years ago ever think that you and Carl would have a business that's so wildly successful and freedom filled? Like that, that, that the freedom filled part is, I think, so key, isn't it? Did you oh. ever dream it was going to be like this? Yes. You did. No, great. Yes. I don't want to lie because I wrote it all down on paper. Yeah. I said what I wanted it to be. I did future scripting exercises, which I teach now in my membership. I meditated on it. I practiced the affirmations. I spent time making my body feel like it already had that life. And so expressing gratitude for something that you don't have yet. Like I practice that all the time. Um, and I made sure that all of my actions matched what my future me had to do to have that. So that meant that I started thinking like a digital business owner all the time and not thinking like an employee, not thinking like Tracy, the teacher, she had to die and disappear. And every thought was replaced with, well, what would a million dollar business owner be doing? Mm. Oh, she'd invest in herself. Okay, cool. Uh, she'd get a mentor. She'd join a mastermind before she was ready. Yes, she would. She would invest in the best quality uh, software for a membership that is going to hold hundreds and hundreds of people. Not the janky version because she doesn't believe that she can fill it. She's going to fill it. And so she's going to start out with the one that is sustainable for years to come. Like things like that. Every decision was run through the filter of what would my future successful self do? And it felt deeply uncomfortable every step of the way because I wasn't there yet. I didn't have the income to match it. And this is the thing. I feel like people can look from the outside and think, oh, my, sounds great to be a digital entrepreneur. It must be easy. Mm. And well, to do it in the lucky, and that's another one, easy and lucky. And you go, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. it's terrifying. It is reprogramming your brain every single day, which is so hard. Making decisions that actively go against what my brain has known and lived for 30 plus years. And so when you, Joe, and the other ladies in the mastermind and the women in my social method society, when they achieve things, I am so happy for them, not because of the result, but because of who they had to be to get to that. It's a really big deal. And that's the unseen work mm. that is truly being celebrated. Yeah. Because mm. it feels uncomfortable all the time. It does. For yes. sure. <laughs> <laughs> So do you just in case anyone next... just in case anyone thought it's a nice easy ride? Yeah, no, um, it hot. feels uncomfortable all yes. the time. Yep, because your brain wants to keep you safe and and and, and in the known. That's all it wants yeah. to do. But and you're stretching. You're saying no. I'm going to be doing something else and thinking a different way. And yeah, it, it, it's not easy. Yes, it's not easy. And you'll have people in your everyday life who you love so much and whom love and care for you watching and feel they're feeling like they're watching a train wreck and they may not understand but it's like you have to be okay with pursuing your vision even without the people that you love the most understanding what you're doing yeah, yeah. one of the one of the biggest things that you talk about in in the mastermind as well Tracy is that the whole idea and concept of life by design and that was something that for me having had a career of bells and rigid timetables and you know feeling ticking boxes and things the idea of of creating a life by design I found really attractive really attractive so when I say life by design and, and you talk about life by design we know what it means but can you explain to the listeners what a life by design is so if someone's thinking and contemplating about a change this could be a really important key element for them to keep in mind yeah well if you're living a life by design then you are in the driver's seat versus being in the passenger seat and being at the mercy of just whatever happens in your day. It's little tiny things. It's waking up in the day and deciding how you're going to show up or who you're going to be in this day. Choosing your energy, choosing your contribution, and then approaching the day with that as your compass or as your guide. But then it's also as big as 
looking at your life and saying, well, <clears throat> this is what I want it to be. And then this is where I am now. And actively choosing habits, behaviors, ways of thinking, being, um, placing yourself in an environment, connecting yourself with an environment, I mean, like that is conducive or that is a match for the life that you're wanting to create for yourself. So, you know, communities, mentors, like who are the people that you're putting yourself in the environment with? And all of that is either leading to that life by design. And if it's not, the only other alternative is living a life by default, meaning being a victim, being passive, just letting things happen, drifting, and slowly, slowly you you lose yourself in that. And then we wake up and we're like, holy crap, where did my life go? Or I'm not really happy. I don't want to do this anymore. What have I been doing with my life? That's a wake-up call that some people have. Um, but for other people, it's through pain and injury or illness or loss. So it's like just tapping into it's like, oh, what do I want? And I think as women, we forget that we get to say what we want or we haven't always been allowed to say what we want. Mm -hmm. um, but we get to we get to ask for what we want. We get to decide what we want. And life is here to be lived and experienced to the full. And so we get to go after the things that bring us joy. We get to tap into our purpose. We don't have to settle for mediocre doesn't feel good, it's not right for you. Do something else. That's what the life by design is. And it takes it can, into consideration not just our careers and business, but it takes into consideration how we show up in our relationships, with our life partners, in our marriages, um, with our kids, in our communities, in our religion or spirituality, in our pursuit of hobbies and things that bring us joy, in our um, exercise and nutrition, all of it is connected. It like builds a big picture um, and that is our, our life by design. So we have to take radical responsibility over all of those areas. Mm. It's a holistic approach, isn't it? And that whole, when you were, that yeah. key word that you had at the end was responsibility. We all have to take 100% responsibility for our choices. So doing nothing is still a choice. And that's what I think a lot of people yes. forget. That, you know, but by, by choosing to remain where you are in an unhappy state is still a choice with its own set of consequences that are going to happen with it. Totally. Mm. People do forget that. Yeah. It's like, oh, you know, they think they're procrastinating or they're living in indecision. It's like, no, that's a choice. Mm. Like that, and that does have consequences, yeah. Yeah, and that's where the I think the power, and we, we, we touched on the mentorship and the really the real importance of mentorship to be surrounded by like mind of people or, or at least one person who can yeah. understand what it's like and to help guide you through that as well when it is hard. And it's going to be hard because yes. you're creating a whole new way of being, a whole new operating system in, in your brain, mm -hmm. a whole new way of thinking and being. That's right. So, so control, I'll delete, isn't it, that you're pressing the buttons on to, to create mm -hmm. something brand new, a whole new software program. Yeah, and if we've been operating in that state for 40, 50, 60 years, it is really hard but not impossible and neuroscience tells us that we can rewire our brains but we do need support in doing that mm -hmm. and I think that's where mentorship is brilliant because it's just more, it's more intimate and it's important that we choose someone that does understand us, like a mentor that has lived the thing or still lives and embodies the thing that you're trying to do, like that, that is essential. I share that because I do get asked quite often, like, how do you choose a good mentor? Well, that's one of the things, hmm. you know, are they a living, breathing example of the thing that you're wanting to do or create or be? If they are, that that's one tick. Yep. Another is like, are they always investing in themselves um, you don't want a, a mentor that's kind of stagnated or plateaued. So, yep, they are. Okay, cool. Um, but yeah, they're just a couple of things that you can look out for. But the, the third one would be, 
if you get value from them, so when they speak, like listening to this podcast or reading their emails or following them on Instagram, if you get value and you enjoy being in their presence or things click when they've said them or you find yourself going, oh, what would what would she have said if she was here with me right now? Well, that's another sign that like that's a really great person for you to be around because there's like a, that's an energetic match mm. that you can't ignore. Yeah. yeah. Great tip seventh. Thank you, Tracy. Now I'm going to slightly change as we wrap up our our chat this afternoon. Um, how has growing older? Because you're you're going to be hitting forty next year. Yeah. How has how has growing older changed or shaped your thinking? Mm. Thinking about what in particular? Just your current, maybe the way that you think, the way that you see the world. Because as as you get older and you'll find that with each decade, you you start to view the world slightly differently. Yes. How has growing older shaped your thinking and changed that? Well, I what I've realised more and more is that there are so many realities going on at once, not just mine. So you know, you've got your perspective and your reality of what's happening in the same instance as how I'm perceiving it. And that's going to be different from the 20 other people in the room. And none of them are right or wrong. They are just what they are. And that's it. And so for me, it's really comes down to being less judgmental and more tolerant of everyone's views and opinions, but also everyone is just doing the best that they can with, and they come with their own context, like life experience, cultural context. We're all just a product of our environments and what we've experienced and also what we're yet to experience. Like it's all altering our views. And so when I especially in the hard times when there's like a bump in the road or someone is unkind or things aren't fair or whatever. I just look at it for what it is. It's like, no, they're not good or bad. I'm not good or bad or right or wrong. It just is. What we experience just is and it's real. What they experience is real for them and what I experience is real for me. And that's all that there is. Like I just... I think that's been a big thing for me because I used to live a life where I was very offended easily or let down or disappointed uh, or I'd hold people to a standard that then they couldn't meet and then I'd make that mean things and I just don't, I just am so, I'm free of that now and that feels really good. It feels really light. Like I'm very, I'm not really disappointed by people anymore. I don't really care. Everyone's doing the best that they can. No one's out to get me. Nothing's unfair. I am where I am because of the choices that I've made. You you made that point earlier. And so that's, yeah, that's kind of my perspective. And I love that. Hopefully that serves me well in the next decade. More peace, more fun. Just chill out, Tracy Harris. Oh, you're, so. you're going to love getting older. You truly are. So <laughs> what are you most looking forward to as you as you get older? Oh, my this, gosh. Next stage of life just a really strong, healthy, fit body that enables me to get the most out of life. Like when I'm working out every morning, it is not for vanity or uh, being able to wear certain things or whatever. It is truly, I am visualizing myself when my boys are 20 and 30 years old or 40 years old. I'm like, how do I want to be? What type of grandmother do I want to be? How do I want to keep up with them on the holidays that that we go on and things like that? Like that's what I am working towards, that longevity. Oh God, Trace, that is so rare. And that's that's a lot of the work that I do, um, especially in the in my membership, the Better Than Before membership and the in the education that I do is to try to get women to see not not just where they are now, but to project themselves where they would like to be when they are. Yes. When they're 70, when they're 80, how are you wanting to be? What are you wanting to do? And work back from there. Yeah, that's everything. And I think that sums up this conversation beautifully. Everything 
is about working backwards from your vision. So whether it's your physical health or whether it's your business or your career or your marriage or whatever it is, it's like, what do you want it to be in the future? And understand that it's like, start with the end in mind, really. Hmm. It's not, we don't start where we're at now. Yeah. No, it's going to take forever to get there if you start with that, if, you, if you'll even get there at all. But when you start with the end in mind and work backwards, it's like, I'm already worthy to be there. I'm going to invest in myself. I'm going to get that mentor. I'm going to do that thing. I'm going to sign up for that gym membership or whatever it is. Do it because the future version of you has already done those things. Yep. But yeah, start with the end in mind. Yes. Well done. I, that That's a great piece of advice to take through no matter what age. Everything. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So Trace, who is your, who are your current role, role models? So who do you look up to? Hmm. That's a really good question. I don't know. Do they have to be alive? No. Oh, okay, good. Um, I'm constantly inspired by Nelson Mandela, um, former, well, he's passed, but former president of South Africa, because I feel like he really was able to master his vision for a future that was not matched by his environment at all. And that's incredibly hard to hold a vision so strong um, when the odds are really stacked against you and you're experiencing the worst of humanity. To have that vision, mm-hmm. I, I just think that to me is so inspiring and I, I think it comes back to that whole importance of vision and starting with the end in mind. And it's like at all costs, we have to protect our vision and always, always, always be chipping away at that. So I draw great strength from from him and, and his work. Um, I think that's about, that's probably, probably my number one guy, I reckon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's a pretty impressive role model. <laughs> and he does, he's, he basically is practicing everything that we've talked about today and what you what you embody as well. Yes, very much so. Mm. Um, and stands he stands for freedom and, you know, justice and all of those things. And they are very much values for me too in the work that I do. Tracy, we've got one more question. This is my wrap-up question. So if you could look into the future, what do you hope 80-year-old Tracy will say about current day Tracy? Um, I hope 80-year-old Tracy feels really proud that I wore clothes that didn't have much fabric. (laughs) (laughs) And and I I I hope there's an and. Um, and that she just danced and laughed her way through life and just had really good times. And she constantly reinvented herself because she can. Love it. Hmm. I hope 80 year old Tracy is going to say exactly that. And I wonder what 80 year old Tracy is going to be wearing. How how much fabric she'll be wearing. (laughs) I hope she's rocking a bikini. I hope she is too. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I do. That's the goal. And she'll be like chilling at a beach club in Bali or something, like still Maldives. just loving maybe, it. Maybe she's with her, with her husband, Carl, back at the Maldives. Oh, yeah. Really he, better, he better keep working on that bod. <laughs> he's got to keep up with Tracy. Yeah, he does. Exactly. No, he's so fit. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Oh. But we want to stay active and like just yep. keep having fun. Excellent. And, and also... My boys are my biggest goal. Like I I just am so passionate about them always being close with each other as brothers and our family unit always being close. Like I want us all to continue to enjoy spending time together, Um, not just on holidays, but just in everyday life, like being each other's best friends and support crew and all of that for the rest of their lives. So just building that relationship with them is just always my top, top priority. So when I'm 80, I want to be like, oh, my boys are my best friends. Gosh, we had a good time. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. 
Well, thank you so much today, Tracy, for your time. I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. We've covered a fair bit of country. And yeah. <laughs> we've got quite deep in parts, but thank you. I've really, really enjoyed it. Oh, you're so cool. When I grow up, I want to be Joe, everyone. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Trace. All right. Oh. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening and sharing your time with me today. I'd love you to hit subscribe on Apple Podcast or your favourite podcast app and leave a five-star rating and review. To keep spreading these empowering messages, please share this podcast with other incredible midlife women in your world. Join me again next week for another redefining midlife conversation. Thanks again for tuning in.